Hi, I'm Bill Gross. I'm excited to talk to you about radical ideas to save the planet. I feel that technological innovation is our best weapon to solve this climate challenge we have. Right now, as you all know, the world is on fire. It's on fire because we are trashing the earth. I think each of us know we make a lot of trash. Every single person on earth puts about one pound of trash into landfills every day. So about seven billion pounds of trash go into landfills every single day. But less well known is that on average, each of us on earth put about 31 pounds of CO2 trash up into the atmosphere. 31 times as much trash into the sky as we do into the ground. Each of us is adding almost 100,000 cubic meters of CO2 to the atmosphere every day. This is drawn to scale. That's a person below that huge cube of CO2 each of us are releasing into the atmosphere. If CO2 was maybe more visible, maybe we would have acted sooner. But we're using this thin sliver of our atmosphere as our new landfill for our CO2. The extra heat that we're adding to the Earth is the equivalent of three Hiroshima bombs going off every single second of every single day. It's just staggering. And of course, the effects have been catastrophic. You all know we've had more severe fires, more severe droughts, more severe storms, and there's much worse to come. In fact, over a year ago, half a billion animals died in Australia in just a short period of time because of what we've done. The solution is so simple, seemingly. It's just four words. It's stop burning fossil fuel. The problem is that is so hard because it's, we love our lifestyles. Energy is one of the most important things for our comfort and convenience and our GDP. In fact, it's the most important en industry on Earth. It accounts for so many things and it's fully 10% of the entire $86 trillion global GDP. Energy is $8.6 trillion every single year. And price really matters. There's a dramatic increase as a function of cost. Every single penny of cost of reduction in the price, say, per kilowatt hour of energy causes almost a trillion dollars of extra market share. That's how price sensitive this is, because energy is so fundamental to everything. And people are not willing to pay more. Renewable energy to replace those fossil fuels just must be cheaper. So how do we make renewable energy cheaper than fossil fuel? Well, I want to tell you my lessons learned from starting more than 150 companies and the whole journey I've taken to discover what I think are some of the angles to help make us successful and why we need thousands of shots on goal to do it and why entrepreneurship is so much the answer. Well, my journey started with a transformative event when I was 15 years old. I saw gasoline rationing when I was a teenager. It was 1973. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. There was the Arab oil embargo and there were long lines to buy rationed gasoline. You only could buy $5 of gasoline on any given day based on the last digit of your license plate, whether it was even or odd, you can buy on even or odd number days. And I remember waiting in these long lines on Ventura Boulevard with my mother to buy her $5 of gasoline. And it wasn't enough to drive my brother and sister and I to school. So we had to ride our bikes long distance to school. And while I was riding my bike to school, I thought long and hard about this. Is there some other way we could power our planet than needing a resource which is delivered from somewhere across the planet, which can be shut off at will and which is so important to our livelihood? So I started reading everything I could. I would go to the library after school. I would read popular science and scientific American magazines. I would read all the textbooks on this, everything I could about renewable energy, solar energy, and I actually even started making all kinds of solar concentrators. First out of cardboard, then out of aluminum. I would sit in the back of English class and draw little plans for these things. And I started this little business called Solar Devices. It was a little tiny mail order business selling these kits and plans in the back of Popular Science Magazine. I would sit in the back of class with my little peachy folder and draw out drawings of how you could make paraboloids out of flat sheets folded up in the right shape. I had just taken trigonometry, so I learned how to do those calculations. I would draw up the plans and carefully type them up and duplicate them at Kinko's. I would learn everything I could about the mail order business and go down to the library too and read those books and keep track of all my customers and send out mailers and test, 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 all those different things. And I really, really had a lot of fun doing that. In fact, I sold 10,000 plans at $4 each, and it actually paid my way through college. When I graduated from college, it was the exact month the IBM PC was released. I think my solar energy business even helped me get accepted to college, because I remember writing about that on my application. 
And because the PC was released, I was blown away with its capabilities. It was 1981, and I started a software company making a natural language interface to Lotus 123, and that was actually acquired by Lotus in 1985. And then I started a second software company in 1991 because my son had started kindergarten. It was an educational software company. And you'll see how this all fits into the story on renewable energy in a moment. And I, I sold that company to Vivendi after building that up to be the number three educational software company. That company was called Knowledge Adventure. And after that entrepreneurial journey, I really was in love with starting companies. I really wanted to start many companies. And that's when I started Idealab as a technology incubator. It was 25 years ago this year. It was a business designed to create businesses, to explore all these different areas. I wanted to build all the shared resources for company creation, and I modeled it initially after what Edison Labs was, sort of as a startup studio where we could build different technologies and spin them out into different companies. And my whole goal was to look for opportunities that are big and broken, brainstorm technology solutions to fix them, and of course, as we look today, Humanity's biggest challenge is powering the planet renewably. Well, back when I started Idea Lab, I had these first 12 ideas in 1996. We started those first companies off, and since then I've had more than 5,000 different ideas in many areas. We've started more than 150 companies. We've had more than 50 successful IPOs and acquisitions, and I've had many lessons learned, and I want to share a few critical ones of those and how they apply to the climate solution. Well, I look back recently on our 25th anniversary at what were my most valuable lessons learned? What were the top 25 things I wish someone had told me 25 years ago before I started Idea Lab? And these are those 25 lessons. Now, you won't be able to read these on the screen right now, but we have these all at the Idea Lab website. And I even made short videos about all 25 of these lessons, and they're free, and love you to take a look at them in case any of them are relevant to you. But I'll call out five particular ones that are so relevant to the climate effort. The first one is challenge the status quo. I love this quote from Schopenhauer. We love it so much we have it on the wall when you walk in our building about how all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Then soon as it gathers some traction, it's actually violently opposed. And third, it's accepted as being self-evident. Now, when you cause something to move through those three stages, you've actually changed the world. You've made something come into being that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Well, challenging the status quo in the energy transition is very important. We need to do that on a large, large scale. The second lesson learned, great timing. Timing matters so much to the success of an idea. I've started so many companies that were ahead of their time and didn't work. I started so many companies that were too late and didn't work. But right now, timing is so valuable and, and accepted for climate work. The world is finally accepting it. I actually read in the New York Times today that finally 76% of America agrees there's only 12% deniers. That's still awful, but there's only 12%. We're making progress. It's not 50-50 or 25-75 like it was so recently. People actually believe that the energy transition is real, is important, and is happening. And that timing is really a tailwind for all climate work right now. The third lesson, use Moore's Law. So I feel we're competing with fossil fuels. How do you compete with something that has almost no cost of goods and you dig out of the ground, you just burn it and you get free energy from it? Not free, but close to free because it's so inexpensive. Well, I feel that the thing you can use to compete is Moore's Law. Exponential curves crush linear and nothing has ever gone down as much in price or as fast of the cost of computing power. So I feel that all businesses that smartly harness this effect will win, but I feel especially climate-related businesses need to figure out how can they use Moore's Law somewhere in their equation to be more competitive? And I'll show you how I've done that in a few companies of mine, but I really urge other people to look for that angle. How can you put in more AI, more computer vision, more computation, more robotics, more automation, all the things that come and get cheaper and cheaper over time with Moore's Law? How do you use that to battle the climate crisis? Here's a graph that shows commodities fluctuating over time. Everything fluctuates over time, up and down, often only going up in the long run. But whether you look at coffee or beef or steel, right now steel is way up. But the one thing that's a constant going down, cost of computing power. That green curve going down is just going down exponentially. And using that is so, so valuable. Two more lessons I'd love to share. Iterate like crazy. You never get it perfect out of the gate. Every one of these ideas that we do to implement a big change in the energy transition needs iteration to both get product market fit, but to evolve the idea to be competitive. So that 
you should never give up on the first try. And I, I learned that painfully myself because some of the things I tried in this area did not work out. And I actually heard a great talk from Reed Hoffman once that gave me the confidence to go try again, even when I failed at some of the things, mainly looking at it like an at-bat or looking at it like a shot on goal. If you have an at-bat and you strike out, but you saw the pitcher and you learned something from it and you saw something new, you go up and take another at-bat. You don't give up after one strikeout. And I definitely feel that that is very, very important in my career, but also very, very important in succeeding in this energy transition. And the last one, be persistent. This is a little bit of the same thing, but it's a little bit different in the sense that the emotional journey of creating anything great, the emotional journey of doing something big and having big impact on climate change is going to have, it's gonna start out as the best idea ever, Maybe it'll have that great outcome, but in the middle, there's gonna be a dark swamp of despair that you have to climb through. How you manage that adversity, how you cross over to the other side, that matters the most. And knowing that that's there, and that was there for the greatest of entrepreneurs, that was there for Steve Jobs, that was there for Walt Disney, that's there for so many great entrepreneurs, and how they climbed across the other side is the difference between their success and failure. And I really urge that as a very important lesson that I learned. I wish someone had told me more about that when I first started at DLab 25 years ago. So now, how can you apply this to the climate challenge? Well, we need to apply it, as I said, in thousands of places. Two particular ones that I've chosen to apply this to are energy storage and making solar fuel, making green hydrogen, using sunlight to make something that can replace fossil fuel. I'll tell you the particular story about those two, but I'm really not talking about these in specific. I'm hoping you see the generalization of how to apply some of these ideas to ideas that you have, because I want this to be much, much bigger. We need to do so many things. Again, this is something that's 10% of GDP, so we need to do a lot. So why is energy storage so important? Well, wind and solar, as you know, have had a dramatic reduction in cost over the last decades. 22 times price decline in wind, maybe even more now, 200 times price decline for solar. And we reached a tipping point in 2017. It was a major tipping point in all of history where electrons made from renewable energy were cheaper than fossil fuel made electrons. So now we can make those electrons cheaper, but they're not at the right time of day. Basically, renewables have won, but not necessarily when people need them. Here's a cost curve showing how wind and solar beat gas and coal and diesel, but we need to have them be non-intermittent. So what do we need? We need low-cost storage. It's the final hurdle. We need something, a solution, which to store energy, which when added to the cost of those renewable electrons is still cheaper than fossil fuels. And that's really, really hard because storing energy is harder than making energy. Believe it or not, burning fossil fuels to make a kilowatt hour is less expensive than to hold on to that kilowatt hour later. There's only three major ways to store energy, chemically, thermally, and mechanically. All of them are needed. Chemically are batteries of all types. Thermally is hot or cold storage. Mechanically is flywheels or gravity-based storage. I particularly wanted to take a look at gravity-based storage to see if there's a way we could apply Moore's law to make it more cost-effective and more uniformly executable. Because the cost of storing energy with pumped hydro, which is gravity storage, pumping water up a mountain, was one of the cheapest, and because we want to get five times cheaper than that or six times cheaper than that, I tried to look at ways that instead of pumping water up a mountain, what if you could lift up a weight in place and store the energy even more cost effective. Now, the weight would have to be very, very inexpensive. It would have to be something like dirt, basically, because you can't afford to lift much cost. And the method of holding it up and lifting it has to be very, very efficient. You need to get all the friction out. But in particular, it has to run automatically. So we would need to use computer vision and computer control and robotics and automation to do the lifting and lowering of that weight to get that friction lower than the friction of water flowing in a pipe. And the solution we came up with at a company called Energy Vault, after many, many iterations, many, many tries of things that didn't work, was this computer-controlled crane with multiple arms, with very, very low friction, with very, very simplified lifting, and with very, very heavy weight, 35-ton blocks, that would make it very inexpensive to store energy at a large scale. This would be grid-scale energy storage. We built a prototype of this in the first iteration by buying a used crane and building a simplified model that could prove we could do it and automatically stack them with computer vision. The concept is building up, basically building up a mountain, not needing a mountain, but building up a mountain every day when you have excess energy and then lowering it back down, lowering that weight back down when you want to discharge and get the energy back. And you can get about 85% round trip efficiency, which is very close to lithium ion of 89% and higher than pumped hydro of 75 to 80% because you can really, really reduce things by having simplified pulleys, great steel cables, and very low air drag because you're lifting the weight at relatively low velocity. 
We then built a full-scale system. This is actually an actual photograph of a system in southern Switzerland connected to the grid there, proving that we could lift those weights. Here's a picture of the weights on the ground. These are the 35-ton blocks. Here's one of those blocks being lifted automatically. You can see how large they are. They're one meter by two meter by four meters of concrete and dirt blocks. There's a person standing on one of them next to a row of them. And once we announced this to the world, there was huge demand for it. There's a many billion dollar pipeline of demand because so many people need energy storage. If you have a wind farm or a solar farm and you have power when the wind is blowing or when the sun is shining, but you want to hold on to it for when the wind isn't blowing, when the sun isn't shining, like at nighttime or on cloudy days, this is a great way to store energy in bulk at large scale. Many, many hundreds of megawatt hours or even gigawatt hours. But the important lesson here is lots of iteration, lots of persistence, heavy use of Moore's Law to help drive down the price. The second area where this was applied was another company of Idea Labs called Heliogen. At Heliogen, we wanted to make solar energy into fuel, something that would be transportable, like green hydrogen. And fuel, coal, oil, and gas, that's even 25 times larger than the electricity market right now. Right now, the electricity market for renewables is huge, but the amount of fuel that we burn around the planet is even bigger. And right now, of course, the only transportable and renewable fuel is hydrogen. When you burn it, it's completely clean. The problem is when you make it, it's dirty because almost all the hydrogen that we have today comes from splitting it off of methane, releasing CO2. Now, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, but on Earth, it's not floating around freely. It's almost always connected to something else. It's either in fossil fuels, in all the hydrocarbons, or in biological mass, or in water, of course. Right now, we split most of our hydrogen from methane because it's about the third of the cost of splitting it from water. Splitting it from water takes a lot of energy, and that energy typically would come from fossil fuels, so there'd be no point in splitting hydrogen from water, burning fossil fuels to do that, if you can just split it off of methane. What we need to come up with is a way to split it from water that's cost-effective and fully renewable. Now, you can connect PV to an electrolyzer and make green hydrogen, fully green hydrogen, but it's expensive because the electrolyzer is only being run for, say, six hours a day when the sun is shining. We wanted to come up with a way to run that electrolyzer all day long. So we invented this product we call a sunlight refinery. It enables 100% green hydrogen production because what we do is store the heat prov provided by the sun during the day, concentrated at high temperatures. We store that heat, which is very inexpensive, and then we convert it to electricity as needed and then split water to make hydrogen on demand. And it's basically a function of capacity factor. And this, this graph shows that Solar energy is typically between 20 and 30% capacity factor, meaning about 20% of the day or 20% of the year, you're producing electrons. Wind is higher at typically around 35% capacity factor in a windy location. With the heliogen technology, with the low cost thermal storage, we can get into the 80 to 90% capacity factor range. By having such a high capacity factor, it means that an industrial company who runs all day long or an electrolyzer, which needs to run all day long, could take advantage of readily available power. It's not quite as intermittent as solar and wind. And that's very, very important for heavy industry, and we're focused on industrial decarbonization at Heliogen, or for making green hydrogen. And what we basically did was take a look at old concentrated solar, and again say, how can we apply Moore's Law to this? How can we apply more computation? How can we make this product smaller, make it in a factory, but use lots of image processing, lots of AI and edge detection, and do all kinds of things with the mirror pointing to allow us to make something mass produced in a factory, but then use computation to solve the movement problem of so many mirrors. So we built a modular system that looks like this. It goes way, way hotter than previous concentrated solar. Previous concentrated solar would go to about 500, 550 degrees. We've achieved more than 1500 degrees, again, because of the accuracy of using closed loop tracking. Closed loop tracking with feedback, with cameras, with high resolution cameras, allows you to get way more accurate than you can mechanically. Basically, tracking mirrors optically is better than tracking them mechanically, and that only became possible with the computation power of, say, the NVIDIA GPU in the last five years. So we've sort of taken a look at an old technology that's been around for a long time. Concentrated solar has been around for 50 years, but re-looked at it with modern technology and modern capabilities, and again, advances of Moore's Law. It took us many iterations again to get there. We tried hundreds of different iterations to get there. We then came up with this system, which is this series of small, low-profile mirrors in a field. You can see me standing in the field of mirrors that we built. 
This is what our computer vision cameras see. They look at the field of mirrors, see all the mirrors in real time, and make these micro adjustments to control them very accurately. And now we get a really accurate target. Very, very hot. You can see the target on the right is the spot. It's only the size of a basketball hoop. And it's got the cameras around it, which are looking at the field. And essentially what Moore's law did to make such a huge difference, it enabled us to use less materials, fewer atoms and more bytes. Basically, we traded off atoms of material for bytes of software. And of course, once you put all the effort into writing the bytes of software, even though it takes many, many man years of effort, once you have it, you can replicate those very inexpensively. We can use less labor because the calibration is happening automatically with software, not with people. And we can use less installation labor as well because you can use autonomy and all the capabilities of autonomous installation and what's happened with autonomous vehicles, both for installation and for maintenance. And now what you can do with that is go where the sun is really great, make green hydrogen, but transport that hydrogen to where the sun isn't as great. And now you have a molecule of renewable energy, not just an electron. An electron of renewable energy, you can't transmit quite as far as a molecule. A molecule you can put in pipelines and on ships and move all over the world. So I hope some of these examples show you how we can take some of the lessons learned that I've had in my career, some of the importance of using Moore's Law in computation, some of the importance of persistence and iteration to bring that to this climate challenge to really make a big and positive impact. The way I look at it is humanity started off living in the biology era. We got all of our energy from plants and from our own muscles. Then a couple hundred years ago, we lived in the chemistry era. We got all of our energy from burning things. That was a breakthrough for civilization, but look what it did to our planet. I feel we need to enter and permanently stay in the physics era. The physics era will be when we get all of our energy from the sun, the wind, and nuclear. That will really allow us to have a sustainable planet. That will really be a fulfillment of a lifelong dream of mine, and I know many of yours as well. It's very important, it's very, very big, and it's very, very exciting, and the world wants it right now. I really feel it's the best time in history for climate change and energy transition entrepreneurship. I've been working on this for a long time. I've never seen it this good. There's money available. There's finally money available. The demand is off the charts. The whole world is reachable. And almost any part of the energy business can be disrupted with this new, this new technology and the world finally cares. So I hope this has been helpful. I really urge you to move into this aggressively. Uh, I'd love to be a partner with you or help you in any way I can. I'm focused on these efforts of mine, but also feel free to reach out to me anytime. Uh, bill at idealab.com or bill at heliogen.com. Thank you very much. You've really been a great audience. <laughs>